I'm Jeremy Johnson, the managing editor of the papers of William F. Cody. And on behalf of the Buffalo Historical Center, the Buffalo Bill Historical Center, <laughs> I wish to welcome you to this afternoon's presentation by Dr. Andrew Hirschberger from Bowling Green State University. He's an associate professor of contemporary art history and a chair of art history. He has published multiple peer-reviewed articles on a broad spectrum. I was going to bring his resume in today, but uh, I have a bad back, so I left it in my office. <laughs> but if you're interested in all the articles and publications he's produced, I'd be happy to share that with you. Hershberger received his uh, PhD from Princeton University in 2001, and he holds other degrees from Princeton and the University of Chicago and the University of Arizona. He's nearing completion of a large anthology project entitled Photographic Theory to be published in 2012. His uh, fellowship, his Buffalo Bill Fellowship here, has been, he's been spending three weeks researching in the McCracken Research Library in the Whitney Gallery of Western Art. And his goal is to make comparisons between U.S. Geological Survey era texts with corresponding original photographs by the U.S. Geological Survey photographers. And uh, we've never met before this fellowship. However, just to demonstrate how small of a world this is, he and I were talking, and we both realized that his, he and his wife, and myself and my wife, were both married by the same preacher. <laughs> <laughs> The Hirschbergers in Arizona and the Johnstons in Powell, Wyoming. So, small world. So, please join me in welcoming Dr. Andrew Hirschberger. Well, thank you very much, Jeremy, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, my family is over here, by the way, on the left hand side or the right hand side uh, with me. And when I realized as Jeremy just said, that he and I had been married by the same pastor. I was in shock, as you can imagine. Uh, when I first started applying for this fellowship, I had no idea. Uh, but I did have a friend, you know, the, the man is Dave Hunter. And uh, I knew that he had moved to Powell, Wyoming. And for all I knew, Powell was pretty darn close to Cody. So I figured he might know somebody who could help me, you know, figure out how to move my family for three weeks to Cody. He says, oh yeah, call up my friend Jeremy Johnston. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a minute, how do you know him? So anyway, long story short, thank you very much. Well, it is a great pleasure to be here today. Uh, I'm delighted, actually, to talk about one of my favorite subjects, photography. And I think the combination of photography and geology gets more and more and more interesting to me the more I study it. Uh, in fact, today, while walking to lunch, my family, it struck me that there is a, a chapter at the end of a book, a recent book from 2007, edited by um, Elkins, and the last chapter about photography is entitled Fossils. So photographs, according to James Elkins, are similar to fossils, and in fact other theorists, it struck me, have argued that photographs are like mummies. In fact, Andre Bazin argues in his famous article about photography that photographs, the very first photographs, were mummies. So mummies and fossils are related, according to some people, to uh, you know, photography. So a photograph can be like a rock in that sense, or an inert object. Uh, and so there's an interesting comparison to be made here, I think, between photographs and geological uh, phenomena. So today, that's the question. And in fact, this is a work in progress. Uh, I'm working on an anthology, as Jeremy mentioned, and uh, two, actually, anthologies at the moment. This one, for this fellowship, is entitled Photography and Geology. Uh, and I see uh, my friend Chuck Preston coming in. He's my mentor here, and thank you very much for your assistance. I should also mention uh, thank you to Mary Robinson, who I don't think is here today. She is the director of the McCracken Research Library, and a wonderful colleague, new friend of mine, I'd like to thank all of the staff that I can see and that I can't see uh, in the library. The McCracken Research Library is a fantastic resource for Cody and for anyone like me studying uh, photography and geology or any aspect of the American West. I'm just amazed actually by the depth of the collections here. So thank you all. I see Carly, uh, 
Samantha, the two Karens, a lot of people have been helping me. Uh, dramatically, Mac. Thank you, Mac. Uh, yeah, if I, if I fail to mention your name, Christine Brenza. I wrote a little list here because I knew I'd forget. Um, Christine has been very, very helpful to me in looking at Thomas Moran's paintings. Thomas Moran traveled with uh, William Henry Jackson, one of the photographers we're going to see today. And so it's interesting to be able to see uh, original paintings by Moran that he made in the company of William Henry Jackson, the photographer. All right, so today we're looking at, from the beginning, we're going to start with this man, Carlton Watkins, and his photograph on the screen here of Yosemite. We're going to look at three sites primarily uh, today, and three photographers, three books, in fact, in your library, three very rare books. In fact, I think they're exceedingly rare books today. So we'll begin by looking at the cover of one of them, of the Yosemite book. And I had not had the pleasure of seeing this book intact before I got this nice fellowship here. I think there are very few copies of this book out there in the world. Originally, as I understand it, there were 250 copies of the Yosemite book. But I suspect that at least half of them have been destroyed. I'm just guessing now. Because they have original photographs in them. As you can see on the left hand side of the screen there, there are 24 original prints, original albumin prints by uh, Watkins. This is Carlton E. Watkins, a very famous photographer now. And the text was written by J.D. Whitney, Josiah Whitney, the state geologist of California. So the two of them you know, teamed up to create this wonderful book filled with original photographs. And the reason why these books have been destroyed is because they have original photographs in them. Art collectors will literally take a, a uh, exacto knife and cut out the pages with the original photographs glued into them. And a lot of art museums around the country now have pages from the Yosemite book in their art collection. And we all admire them. I certainly do as a page, you know, as an image. I don't know it's a page because usually the mat is covering that fact up. But in this book, in your library, see these things in the original context with Hayden's descriptions, excuse me, Whitney's descriptions, uh, alongside of them. Now I've listed NYPL uh, there, that's New York Public Library. They scan the cover of their copy, so I'm using their image. There's also a Yosemite National Park copy that I'm aware of, and then MRL. You see, I'll, I'll use these little uh, acronyms, and that means McCracken Research Library which is right down the hall, and I would encourage all of you to take a look. It's a beautiful facility. The second book that we'll look at <coughs> is this book that I love very much indeed called Sun Pictures. Uh, Sun Pictures of Rocky Mountain Scenery, published in 1870 by Hayden and Russell. Hayden, Ferdinand Vanderveer Hayden is the famous explorer and geologist and uh, just an intrepid uh, researcher who is the first person to bring a survey party with a photographer to Yellowstone National Park. We're going to see that in the third book. But in this book, <coughs> Hayden teams up with Andrew Joseph Russell, this wonderful photographer, and the two of them publish a book which is based on, modeled after the Yosemite book. They deliberately say that in their text, that we are modeling our text off of the Yosemite book. This book has 30 original albumin prints glued into the pages by A.J. Russell. So a very significant body of art, again, which unfortunately for this book means that it's very rare today to see all of these pages intact with the text that they were originally published uh, and intended to be seen with. All right, so there's two copies that I'm aware of. The Library of Congress, they scanned or took a picture of their copy, and the McCracken Research Library has one. There undoubtedly are others out there, but there aren't that many, again. Now the third book is so rare that I couldn't find anyone who had scanned or made a photograph of the cover. Uh, it's called Photographs of Yellowstone National Park, and the photographer is William Henry Jackson. The writer, again, is Ferdinand Vanderveer Hayden. So I couldn't show you the cover because I couldn't find a picture of it anywhere. But you can see it upstairs in the Whitney Gallery right in the entrance, it is on display right now, opened up to a page of a William Henry Jackson photograph on the right, 
of the Yosemite, excuse me, of Yellowstone National Park. Uh, so you have a very rare object indeed in your collection. So the third book, I'm going to use a different picture to represent. Oh, pardon me, I got ahead of myself here. <coughs> this Sun Pictures book, to back up a second, I think is echoing a very famous book by William Henry Fox Talbot. And Jeremy was kind enough to mention that I'm working on this massive anthology project. Uh, and I go all the way back to the beginning, beyond the beginning, a sense of photography. And Talbot is one of the inventors of photography. And he thought of his photographs as sun pictures. And his book called Sun Pictures in Scotland is a very nice connection, by the way, with the earlier speaker. Some of you were there earlier today in this room. There was a talk about uh, the influence of Scottish people on the exploration of the West. So here we have a connection with Scotland. Uh, Talbot, let me give you his name here. Talbot, in 1845, publishes this book. And some have argued it's one of the first photographically illustrated books. And I think that Hayden and Russell knew about this book and titled their book after it, Sun Pictures in the Rocky Mountains, essentially, rather than in Scotland. All right, so the third book, the super rare book, uh, is represented by this photograph, for now. I'll show you a whole bunch of pictures in a moment. But it's by an unknown photographer of William, Hen excuse me, of William Henry Jackson. Uh, and all these names get uh, confused in my head, obviously, like William Henry Fox Talbot, William <laughs> Jackson. Uh, this is William Henry Jackson on the summit, 10,243 feet with his horse, horses, with his cameras, in boxes, strapped to the mule, or maybe you're not a horse specialist, maybe that's a mule. Some of you can probably tell me uh, what it is. But this is Jackson, a photographer at the summit of this mountain. And this isn't the highest point that he reached with his cameras by any means. His cameras were huge too, by the way enormous cameras. I had asked uh, around to try and bring in a 4x5 camera. And I, I have a 4x5 camera. I have an 8x10 camera, but I don't have a lens for it. Uh, but those of you in the audience who know uh, cameras, 8x10 is a huge camera. William Henry Jackson was photographing with an 11x14 camera, with a 20x24-inch camera. These are huge cameras. They make unbelievably beautiful pictures they're very, very difficult to operate. These are glass plate negatives, too, that he's hauling around. So if you look in these boxes, if we could go back in time, and wouldn't that be great, ask him to open up those crates, you would find not only large format cameras, huge cameras as big as this podium, but you would find glass plates inside them, too. So Jackson was constantly fighting the problem of fragile glass negatives. And he had to go inside a dark tent and I'm going to try to illustrate this for you. I told Jeremy that I have a very loud voice, and I'm used to lecturing in large lecture halls, so hopefully everybody can hear me. Good. Uh, if you can imagine, at the top of a mountain like this, you bring your horse up there with your cameras, with your glass plates. You have to set up a dark tent, because your film has to be created on the spot, and it has to be developed on the spot. Otherwise, you're not going to get any pictures. This is the wet plate collodion glass negative process that all of these photographs I'm going to show you were made with that process. So if you can imagine, I'm inside my dark tent now. Probably it's pretty small. Probably I'm huddled down on the ground. And it has to be absolutely dark except for a little safe light. Red light is OK. So probably my dark tent has a little red disc in it which allows a little bit of light to come through. The film was only sensitive to blue light time. Very interesting problem for photographers. So in any case, you have a little bit of red light coming in. You're in your dark tent at the top of Mount Washburn, let's say, or some <laughs> other mountain. And you've got a coat, a huge glass plate negative. Let's say it's a 11 by 14, because that's the size of the images that are upstairs. Uh, and you've got to pour a mixture of gun cotton and ether, which is called collodion, highly flammable material. It was invented in the Civil War to be a, like a liquid band-aid for Civil War uh, uh, wounded. So it's liquid band-aid, basically. You're pouring onto this glass plate. You've got to flow it in your dark tent in order to cover evenly this glass plate negative. Then you have to sensitize it in silver nitrate bath 
into your dark tent in order to make it light sensitive. And then you have to stuff it inside a huge film holder. And I'm, you know, 11 by 14 film holder is immense. You've got to stuff it in there wet. Then you have to run outside your tent to your pre-set up camera. It's already set up. The composition is exactly the way you like it. You stick your film holder into the camera. You pull out the dark slide. Sometimes you take the lens cap off because you don't even have a shutter for your camera. You take the lens cap off to expose the picture, put the lens cap back on to stop the exposure. Then you have to stuff that slide, it's called the dark slide, back into the film holder, yank the film holder out of your camera, run back into your dark tent, and develop the picture before it dries. And this is ether we're talking about. You know how ether happens. <laughs> so this is a very complicated process and very exciting, you know, to me, obviously. Uh, it's amazing that these photographers were able to do this, uh, with this process. All right, so I'm actually going to start, in a sense, with one of Watkins's Watkins's <coughs> uh, competitors, a man named Edward or Eadmir. He changed, <laughs> he changed his name a couple of times. Uh, his last real name was Eadmir Mybridge. Some people pronounce it Moybridge. Uh, his real name was Muggeridge, I believe. <laughs> so yeah, he, he changed it. Uh, but he had an interesting taste, obviously, in the first name. And I think it was some kind of royal family name from his English past. Uh, in any case, you may know about his interest in motion. And it struck me in a very important way for me, and I, I want to ask all of you to tell me if you think I'm right or wrong during the course of today's talk. I think there's a relationship between photography and geology. And it's a relationship that is linked to my bridge, oddly enough and this idea of time. Uh, Mybridge is the first photographer to get one two thousandths of a second shutter speed. This is in 1878, one two thousandth of a second shutter speed. That's what allowed him to stop action. When a horse ran across the front of his bank of cameras, he was able to stop the motion of their legs because he was the first person who could figure out how to make a camera operate that quickly. Now, quick things that are too fast for the human eye, we need help, right? People were betting, Leland Stanford, the owner of the horse, by the way, the horse's name is Sally Gardner. That's Leland Stanford's horse. He's the governor of California. He's in a bet with another gentleman. Both of them don't know what a horse's legs do when it's running at full speed. And they disagree. Leland Stanford believed that all four legs of a horse are off the ground at the same time, and his competitor, or his opponent in the bet, said, no, it's just like a hobby horse. If you go to a grocery store, sometimes you can find these little hobby horses that kids will ride on. My kids love to ride on them. All four legs jutted out, two legs behind, two legs in front. That was a convention. And before Mybridge made these photographs, all paintings depict galloping horses with all four legs sticking out like a hobby horse. Two legs sticking out in back, two legs sticking out in front, that was the general convention. People believed that all four legs of a horse were off the ground at the same time when they're out in front and in back. Leland Stanford disagreed. He hired Mybridge to prove it, and Mybridge did that. Mybridge proved that all four legs are off the ground only when they're underneath the horse, not when they're sticking out in front. So geology, now what does this have to do with geology? I think Geologists like Hayden and Whitney are trying to do a similar thing with things that are too slow for the human eye to perceive, like a mountain and its changes. How did it get there? We're talking billions or millions of years of change, very, very slow change. So photography and geology are linked through fast and slow motion in a sense, trying to, trying to depict things that are too fast for the human eye or too slow for the human eye. So one of the things that Mybridge did before cinema existed was he was animating his images. And let me just show you. If you log in now, the internet is so amazing. Uh, there are people out there with a lot of time, and they <laughs> animated all of Mybridge's images. And I'm talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these images. They've all been animated now. You can find these animated versions. So if you take all of these images, except for the last one, and you animate it, lo and behold, 
it is cinema. And Meinrich was doing this with something called a zoopraxis scope. It was a pretty cinematic uh, object which allowed him to, pardon me, animate uh, his pictures. Now, how did he do this exactly? He set up something that was just ingenious. All of these photographers, I think, were amazing in that sense. But if you look at this picture, I'm going to turn around and look at it with you here. You can see that there are 24, I believe, cameras back here. So he's got 24 cameras in a row. And he's got a bright white wall. He's in California with the bright sun. Let me tell you, I live in Ohio, and the sun here in Wyoming is unbelievably bright. Mybridge benefited from the bright California sun. So he's got a white wall, super highly reflective surface. He's covered the ground with white powder of some kind. So he's filling this space with white you know, light, basically, trying to emphasize the light. And then his horse, or his, his buffalo, Linda pointed out a minute ago that he also photographed buffalo running. And I can show you one of those later on if you want to see it. Uh, but 24 cameras lined up. All kinds of different animals would run in front of this, this uh, bank of cameras. And bing, 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 the cameras were fired, one two thousandth of a second. And you create this kind of a pattern. So the horse runs by, and all these cameras fire. You know, we could talk a lot about Myra, she's a fascinating person. But what I want to focus on is before he did these pictures, he was a landscape photographer in competition with Watkins. Watkins is the photographer that uh, did the Yosemite. So Myra, just to point out, he was a competitor. He was interested in geology as well, these rocks mountains of Yosemite. Here's one of his massive, uh, large format. This is a mammoth plate negative. 17 by 22 inch at least negative. The negatives are as big as the positives in this era because you don't have enlarging. There's no enlarging at this time. If you want a big picture, you need a big negative. That's why these guys are carrying massive cameras around in the mountains. So if we look at this in detail, and this projector is pretty sharp, happily, Look at all this detail. You can see the striations on the rocks. I think this is a glacial. I'm not a geologist, by the way. If there are geologists in the room, please correct me. Uh, but you've got all kinds of evidence of geological interest here. Uh, you've got rocks in the lake there, and all kinds of brush in the foreground. And scroll up, uh, so you can see the very bottom of this. Now, how does this link up with that running horse? It struck me very uh, you know, profoundly to me that there is a re-photographic survey going on right now, even as we speak. It's been going on since the 1970s of uh, the, the Western landscapes of people like Watkins and Mybridge and Jackson. The man who leads that survey is a man named Mark Clett, and he has a website. I would encourage all of you to look at his website. I'm going to link to that website right now, and uh, I'll show you his read photographs of Mybridge's Lake Tanaya in the Yosemite Valley. And uh, let me just pull up this uh, website. Because what Mark Clett does, <coughs> believe it or not, is he animates his pictures, just like Mybridge did with a zoopraxiscope. So here is a current photographer in Arizona. Actually, he teaches at Arizona State University, where I first started as a bachelor's student. And I used to sell him camera equipment, by the way. It's an odd world. It's kind of like the Jeremy Johnston connection with uh, Dave Hunter. You know, it's just amazing all the connections that are made over time. But here's the first view, as he calls it, by Edward Mybridge. Second view by Mark Clett and his partner Brian Wolf. And he animates these. So in 2001, Mark Clett made this photograph. In 1872, Mybridge made that photograph. And if you look over here where my, my hand print is there, auto, that's the animation. It goes back and forth. This is very simple cinema, essentially. Just like what Mybridge was doing with the horse, trying to animate things that are too slow for the human eye to perceive using photographs. Very same idea, just the inverse of something too fast, like a horse galloping in front of you. So we're going to be looking at some of Mark Clett's images along the way today. And we'll start off again with this book of Carlton Watkins. This is a mammoth plate version of a picture that you have a variant of in your
Ward Library in the Yosemite book. This one belongs to the San Francisco MoMA Art Museum. So Watkins first travels to Yosemite in 1861 during the Civil War. And he makes this beautiful image using that wet plate collodion glass negative process with a 16 by 20 camera, massive sheet of glass to get a big picture. And again, if I were a geologist, and I'm kind of an armchair geologist today, uh, I'd be looking at what's called erosive <coughs> agents that are working on that wall and mass wasting of granite surfaces. I, I uh, have two colleagues in Arizona, uh, Bob McCormick and Charlie Pruitt, who co-taught a class for five weeks with me on photography and geology. And so everything I know about geology, I learned from them for the most part. Uh, but you know, if they were in the room, looking at this incredible detail again, if you see this at SF MoMA, your eyes will literally pop out of your head, at least mine do, because the detail is incredible be able to see all of these rocks so clearly. You can also see the Nevada Falls over here on the right. If we scroll across here, you can see this, this Mount Broderick, or the Liberty Cap, or the Cap of Liberty, on the left, coming into view. And the surface there is very telling to geologists, very important. And Whitney, in this Yosemite book, writes about this mountain. So we scroll up to the top. And one of the things he says is very curious to me, because I'm, again, I'm arguing now that, that both photography and geology are linked through this kind of cinematic idea, trying to animate things that are too fast or too slow. And what Whitney, now the geologist, the state geologist of California, working with Watkins, says about this mountain, one of the things he says is that there is a juniper tree of immense diameter at the very, very top of this mountain. So there's an interesting thing about ecological time going on here, as well as geological time. So if you think about this, geologically speaking, if Bob McCormick or Charlie Pruitt were in the room, they would be talking about 230 million years ago, the Valley of Yosemite began forming as we know it. So here's a timeline. So geological time is super long term. Uh, here's 200 million years before the present. Yosemite's roots are 230, roughly, million years ago. So a geologist looking at Yosemite is thinking long term. What happened 230 million years ago to form this landscape? And if you can see this in the front row, I'll read it to you. If you can't see it, I'm going to read some of Whitney's text now. But Whitney, about this picture, a variant of it, which I'll show you, he says, the Cap of Liberty is a grand mass of rock, isolated and nearly perpendicular on all sides, rising, there's a key word, this rock is rising. For a geologist in geological time, this rock is actually moving, just like a horse, but it's going very slow. <coughs> so slow we can't perceive it. But it's rising perhaps 2,000 feet above its base, and little inferior to half dome in grandeur. It has been climbed and has on its summit a juniper tree of enormous diameter, he says. So I looked up bristlecone pines, and I believe that they can live for 4,000 years. I don't know about juniper trees. Maybe Chuck can inform us all, but um, that's a long time. But that's not geological time. So it gives you a sense of the uh, time scale. Here is the Yosemite National Park scan of their copy of Watkins' print in the Yosemite book. You also have a version of that print. And again, these are original prints, handmade on albumin paper. Albumin is egg white material, by the way. This is egg white paper that they're printing onto. So this is a very interesting uh, moment in time, geologically speaking and ecologically speaking, for this particular study. Now, let's look at another comparison. This is the George Eastman House mammoth plate image on the left of the same falls by Watkins. So you can compare your library's photograph with the George Eastman House in New York. Notice what Whitney says. He says, the fall itself is not quite perpendicular, as there is near the summit a ledge of rock which receives a portion of the water and throws it off with a peculiar twist, adding considerably to the general picturesque effect. So this curve in the fall right there is part of this interest that he has in the fall. And the photograph shows us that, and it also shows us what he calls the picturesqueness. He says, see photograph. He 
he talks about the photographs in relation to the picturesque quality of the valley. And let me tell you, there's a huge tension in these books between science and art, and it's a wonderful tension. Both Whitney and Hayden are constantly overwhelmed by the aesthetic beauty of the landscape that they're in. And they have to keep reminding themselves, but we're here to study the geology. And I'll read you a couple of those wonderful moments. Here's another comparison. The Smithsonian American Art Museum, S-A-A-M, uh, has a print by Watkins of this waterfall. You can barely see it there in the background, but that's the Nevada Falls right there. And it's an interesting comparison again, because it shows how Watkins worked. He worked like all photographers do, but just a lot slower with his equipment. He photographed this area a lot and in different phases. So Watkins' photographs, like Jackson's, ended up assisting the United States government and the California state government in forming the first state park, which was Yosemite, in 1864. It became a national park in 1890. Now let me just show you all the pictures again just to compare them. So you have a sense of what Watkins is doing with Mount Broderick and the Nevada Falls. And you'll also see in Yosemite the best general view, as it's called, uh, and you might recognize some photographs by other photographers here in a moment. This print is in the Getty, the Getty Museum in California, and it's a mammoth plate, again, photographs. So look at the detail of these areas. Now Whitney is traveling through this valley, and he's writing about it, and he's trying to determine what caused this valley. How did it appear in the way that it does now, over geological time? And what he ends up doing is he asks himself this question. How has this unique valley been formed? And what are the geological causes which have produced these wonderful cliffs and all the other features which combine to make this locality so remarkable? These questions we will endeavor to answer as well as our ability, um, as well as our ability to pry into what went into the deep-seated regions of the earth in former geological ages will permit. So again, he's looking at this valley, and he's trying to imagine, he's trying to animate, he's trying to speed it up. It's not the horse problem, it's the opposite problem. We need to see this film, but we need to speed it up to see the landscape move. Now no, notice what he says, if you are a geologist, you'll probably laugh, I think, at this. Whitney says, a more absurd theory was never advanced than that by which it was sought to ascribe to glaciers the sawing out of these vertical walls and the rounding of the domes. Nothing more unlike the real work of ice as exhibited in the, in the Alps could be found. Besides, there is no reason to suppose, or at least no proof, that glaciers have ever occupied the valley. So that this theory, based on entire ignorance of the whole subject, may be dropped without wasting any more time upon it. <laughs> I, I know. Even a you know, little art historian like me Oh, that's beautiful, you know, to see the changes of geology over time. Uh, clearly, there were glaciers here, according to geologists today. <coughs> so here's another interesting thing. After eliminating all other theories, and believe me, he goes through a lot of theories, he ends up with, with what he calls the subsidence theory. So he says, in other and more simple language, for people like the you know, historian reading this book, the bottom of the valley sank down to an unknown depth, owing to its support being withdrawn from underneath during some of those convulsive moments. So here's that motion. Convulsive movements, pardon me, which must have attended the upheaval of so extensive and elevated a chain, no matter how slow we may imagine the process to have been. So he's looking at this landscape. He's looking at Watkins' photographs while he's writing. That's very important. He's looking at the photographs while he's writing and he's imagining what happened before him. He's adding new, actually older, photographs to the sequence. Now here's what my friends Charlie Pruitt and Bob McCormick showed me and others in this class on photography and geology. Indeed, there were glaciers, according to them, in the valley and they carved out these surfaces quite prominently. And it's a classic U-shaped valley, according to their interpretation, uh, formed by glaciers. Now, I mentioned that you might recognize some other photographers' works. Watkins was very uh, important to the development of Ansel Adams' style. 
And you can see Ansel Adams almost literally puts his tripod in the same place that Watkins did in 1865-66. Adams' print on the right from 1944 is published in a book, which I would encourage you to look at, called Born, Free, and Equal, about the Japanese internment camp of Manzanar, which is very close to Yosemite. And interestingly enough, in the galleries of the McCracken Research Library, this very day, you can go down and see a Heart Mountain uh, exhibition of photographs of a Japanese internment camp here in Wyoming. So Adams was doing a similar project in 1944 uh, in California. All right, I'm going to have to uh, show you a few more Watkins here because I can tell I'm too excited about the subject and I need to get to the next group. Uh, this image is a page, I believe, from the Yosemite book, but it wasn't included ultimately. Watkins published, a, I mean, Watkins printed a lot of images that weren't included for his editor, basically, probably Whitney. He said, well, maybe not that. And so this, this is a page from the book, but it was never included. It's now in the Smithsonian. And uh, you can compare it with the one that was included on the right, that horizontal version. And notice what Whitney says. He, he says, these three brothers, as they're called, these peaks, rise in steps one behind the other, the highest being 3,830 feet above the valley. The photograph will render any description of the peculiar outline of these rocks unnecessary. So photographs are really useful to a geologist like Whitney. They render the description unnecessary. Look at the photograph. Now compare that to this page of Yosemite Falls. This is also a page. This is indeed a page that was included. It's now on the walls of the Smithsonian. Uh, and you have the page intact here in your library. So it's called the Yosemite Falls. And notice what Whitney says about it. He says, the finest photograph, however, is utterly inadequate to convey to the mind any satisfactory impression or realization of how many of the elements of, elements of grandeur and beauty are combined in this waterfall and its surroundings and accessories. In vertical height of roughly 2,600 feet, it surpasses, it is believed, any waterfall in the world with anything like an equal body of water. And they measure the water at 220 cubic feet per second coming over the top of the falls. So Whitney is writing about this incredibly beautiful landscape and trying to understand how it was created. Now here's another Watkins uh, print in the Cleveland Art Museum. These are all over the place. This is a beautiful 16 by 20 glass plate negative that was printed on album and paper. And again, you have an immense amount of detail. Ansel Adams photographed in this spot as well. I can show you this incredible uh, rendering of Half Dome. The uh, far right side is Half Dome. It's an immense block of granite. And as you scroll across, you can see, if you're a Yosemite buff, there's all kinds of main peaks and areas to explore. Here is the print, the version of it, in the Yosemite book. A smaller camera was used. Again, there's no enlarging, no reducing. Each print had to have a separate, separate size negative to make a separate size picture. So Whitney says about this particular scene, that the whole appearance of the mass of Half Dome is that of an originally dome-shaped elevation with an exceedingly steep curve of which the western half has been split off. So he's thinking about this long geological time, actions happening like a huge half of this dome falling apart. So those who have not seen it could never comprehend its extraordinary form and proportions, not even with the aid of photographs. So on the one hand, photographs get rid of the need to describe things. On the other hand, you can't understand things by looking at photographs. So there's, again, a wonderful tension here about what can we say about photographs? What can these photographs provide for a geologist? All right, the last Watkins I'll show you is this comparison with Adams' famous view of Half Dome. Adams believed that this was his best early picture, his very first picture that he owned as an artist. Uh, it's called Half Dome. And he used a red filter to get the sky very, very dark. He was using, or excuse me, he was using panchromatic film, which is sensitive to all the colors of the spectrum. Watkins was using only blue light sensitive film, this wet plate collodion glass negative process. So very different renderings uh, of the mountain. Uh, but in any case, Adams is clearly standing right there in order to make this view 
of the face. So Adams was an intrepid hiker, as you probably all know. All right, so our second book is the Sun Pictures book. And uh, this one will blow your mind as well if you look at it in, in the original. There are 30 of Russell's pictures. And just to give you a brief summary of, the, of what's going on in the United States, this is right after the Civil War. I'm not going to dwell on this. Wyoming is not a state yet. Arizona is long not a state yet. Uh, so a lot of these areas are not states. They're territories. Wyoming territory, territory didn't even exist when Russell started photographing for this project. So this is Nebraska territory uh, for a time, and then it becomes uh, uh, Wyoming territory. So here we are in a place called Sherman Station, the Laramie Mountains. Andrew Joseph Russell's original Halberman print in the book with Hayden's description. Hayden says about this skull rock, time wears off all the sharp points in thin spherical layers year after year. This rock, which has given name to one of these striking rock masses, has been peeled off. You can hear, in a sense, the process happening. Peeled off coat by coat by the fingers of time. So those horses running across the screen now are fingers of time going ever so slowly, peeling back the layers until it presents a, a close resemblance to the human cranium, he says. And look at this. This is the human cranium. The three of Russell's associates posing right underneath it. So skull rock created by the fingers of time, peeling away slowly over the millennia. Here's another example, dial rock. Hayden says, these level plains, covered now with grass and wild sage, were once on a level with the summits of these sandstones, at least, while the vast mass of sandstone, which filled up the general level, has been swept away, leaving these hoodoos, as they're called. Who knows where? Who can estimate the forces that have wrought this mighty work, or the immensity of time that it required. So those fingers of time have peeled away an entire plane of sandstone, leaving only these interesting formations. Let me enlarge that for you. So here's human scale, one of Russell's associates posing to give you a sense of scale. This whole level, Russell and, and Hayden are saying, was filled up to that point. And over time, erosion has taken away that entire mass of rock. Here's a third, and this book, this book in some ways is stranger than fiction. Uh, some, of the, some of the Western phenomenon that they encountered are just mind-boggling to me. This is what Hayden says about this place called Burning Rock Cut. During the progress of the work to create the railroads, the men built a fire by the side of the wall, and the rocks ignited burning for some days, illuminating the labors of the workmen by night and filling the valley with dense smoke by day. I've never lit a rock on fire before, but that struck me as, wow, the West was just so profoundly fascinating uh, at this time. You can see immense quantities of fossils also in these rocks, according to Hayden. All kinds of fossils of bird feathers, of birds and of <coughs> plants, I can't remember all of them, fish. I mean, it was just like these fossils were everywhere, according to his description. Here's my favorite one. This is Castle Rock. Hayden says, I have called the formations along the Green River, the Green River Shales, from the fact that the se sediments, those are sediments, again, settling over millions and millions of years. The sediments are arranged in regular layers, mostly thin, like shales, varying, however, with the thickness of a knife blade to several feet. Now this is my favorite because it shows us the photographer's dark room, the traveling dark room, on the back of the horse-drawn carriage. That's right there. There's very similar photographs of Russell's dark room and other images, and also Timothy O'Sullivan's dark room traveled in a similar manner. So very interesting uh, image of photography in relation to the geology. All right, this one's a happy coincidence because Watkins also photographed here. Now, I'm not going to read the text, but 
But let me just show you this incredible sentinel rock. Human scale is important to Russell and Watkins and uh, Jackson. So this is a huge towering element that shows, according to Hayden, the geological time again that he is fascinated by and those layers of sediment and how they've been eroded away over time. And each of these layers tells a story, like a ring in a tree uh, cut. So here's the comparison. This was fun. I didn't know about any of these points, by the way, until I read the book. Uh, so here's the comparison between Watkins on the right and Russell on the left. It's almost like a re-photographic survey before anyone knew it. Uh, and one is, one is 1869, the other is 1873. They're almost in identical positions. It struck me that these two photographers liked this composition very much. All right, the last uh, photograph I'll show you from Sun Pictures is Hanging Rock. It is probably the most famous picture. Hayden says this about it. The isolated rounded mass, which seems to stand alone and almost ready to tumble into the valley below, is quite firmly seated on its bed of sandstone. Again, this was all a level plain at one point, or a level area, and it was eroded away. So this bed of sandstone and the corresponding portions may be seen forming the base of the hanging rocks, just back of the man seated on the ground, as represented in the photograph. So if we look at the details, here's the man he's describing underneath this famous hanging rock. Here's the bed of sandstone, which is its base, that bed used to be all the way across here to this bed of sandstone, which is the base of either the Sphinx of the Valley, as it was called, or the Pulpit Rock. And Brigham Young apparently gave a lecture to his followers from that Pulpit Rock one time. Oddly enough, William Henry Jackson, the third photographer I'll talk about briefly, is photographing in the same site in 1878. I didn't know about this either until I studied in your library. So these photographers were already visiting some of the same sites and photographing from almost the same positions. So the rephotographic survey makes a lot more sense to me now because the early photographers were doing it as well. Now notice, this one's really cool. Rick Dingus worked for Marklet. Marklet is the leader of the rephotographic survey. In 1978, Rick Dingus takes his camera back to the same site, and notice what he finds. Pulpit Rock is no longer there, and it makes me almost want to cry, actually, when I see that. Um, the railroads and the roads apparently needed that space, and according to Mark Klett's book, which is in your library, called Third View, a uh, wonderful book, uh, he talks about this comparison. This was dynamite in order to clear the way for uh, the road building in this area. So Brigham Rung's pulpit uh, is no longer there. So notice what Hayden and his colleague Newberry say. Now this, this particular quote gave me the idea for this lecture, though. And so I'm, I'm delighted to read this to you. It was so interesting to me. If you've studied the history of cinema, uh, you'll know that there's something called the Phantasmagoria, which starts in the 18th century becomes very popular in the 19th century. It's the first moving picture show with a lantern slide that was held by somebody holding a movable projector. And they would project onto steam or fog or smoke, and they would project onto walls and onto the ceiling. People were fascinated by this presentation called the Phantasmagoria. And notice what Newberry, a colleague of Hayden, says. He's writing in the same book. He says, these changes, which I have reviewed in an hour, seem like the swiftly consecutive pictures of the phantasmagoria. So he's thinking like Mybridge. He's trying to speed it up, though. He's trying to make it swift. These changes, which I have reviewed in an hour, seem like the swiftly consecutive pictures of the phantasmagoria, or the shifting scenes of the drama. But the eons of time in which they were affected are simply infinite and incomprehensible to us. We have no reason to suppose that terra firma was less firm, or that the order of nature in which no change is recorded within the historic period was less constant then than now. At the present rate of change, throwing out man's influence, a period infinite to us would be required to revolutionize the climate, flora, and fauna. Now 
this quote is so important in relation to earlier speakers that have been in this room about the climate change that's happening right now, according to most scientists. And it's interesting to me that here's this early author thinking about you know, how slowly things change. It would take an infinity of time to change the climate, he's saying, throwing out man's influence. So maybe Newberry even had a thought, gee, maybe we are affecting the climate. And just like this pulpit rock disappears overnight in geological time based on dynamite uh, rather than erosion, uh, things change quickly with man's influence. Uh, Russell photographed this site quite a bit. Jackson photographed this site quite a bit from a variety of angles. And now people like Mark Clett and his collaborators are photographing. So our third and final candidate today is <coughs> William Henry Jackson. He's one of my favorites. I have so many, but he's really interesting. Uh, notice him photographing in high places. One of his associates photographed him. Here's Jackson. Here's his assistant. Here's a different print from, I think, the same negative, but a vertical crop. Here is the glass negative box. You could also use that to sensitize the glass negatives with your silver nitrate out in the field. But just think about hauling all this. There's no horse that can go up to the top of this mountain. They were hauling a lot of weight, a lot of fragile glass negatives, very high in the mountains, in order to make these pictures. So what does he do in Yellowstone? Jackson, I think someday, um, somebody, maybe me, should write a screenplay about Jackson's life uh, because it is so utterly, unbelievably fascinating. He is hired by Hayden to be in the survey, which is the first survey to have a photographer to go into what was called Coulter's Hell at one point, which is now Yellowstone, or the Yellowstone National Park. And the photographs were important for Hayden because they, in a sense, proved that these geological formations and geysers and whatnot actually did exist. They weren't just figment, figments of people's imagination. And so some scholars have argued whether it was Jackson's photographs that were very instrumental in creating the first national park anywhere in the world because they proved the existence of features like the man with hot springs. And if you go into the Whitney Gallery, by the way, there's an immense purple painting by Stephen Hannock of uh, Yellowstone, of the Yellowstone Falls. And it's Stephen Hannock is a contemporary artist. He writes about the importance of these photographs and says, it didn't matter that Moran's paintings were so impressive. I mean, the, the Congress bought Moran's paintings for $10,000. Stephen Hannock says, on his painting of Yellowstone, it was the photographs that made the difference. I think many people would agree with Stephen Hannock. It's a very interesting painting for you to look at right after this lecture. Uh, so the Hayden survey goes out. Jackson is the photographer. In this moment, he's using an 11 by 14 camera. He also has smaller cameras. You don't just have one camera. You've got multiple cameras that you're hauling around with you. And Thomas Moran is in the picture, too, by the way. Thomas Moran, the painter, is posing with his hammer or his pick up against the uh, formations of, of mammoth hot springs. And in the book, you get all this information that you don't get when you look at this picture on a gallery wall. Hayden writes about this. The larger hot springs are located on the terrace above. And as the heated water flows, there's that word about motion. This is about motion. The heated water flows over the declivity. The beautiful pool-like basins are formed from four to eight feet wide and two to four feet deep. So these pools, which they actually swam in, the, the cooler ones, uh, they were baths at one time, apparently. Uh, even named Diana's Baths by certain people. Uh, so Moran and Jackson, actually Jackson used the hot water to help <coughs> him speed up the process of the wet lake loading glass negative developing. Uh, it was very good for photography, he writes. Uh, so this is, you know, this is a beautiful preserved image in your book in your, um, this rare book, which doesn't exist anywhere on the internet. It exists upstairs in the Whitney Gallery. There's a print by Jackson of this image, and it is so incredibly sharp, you won't believe how clearly you can see the hammer that uh, Moran is holding his hand. Jackson was also photographing with a stereo cam. It's like the phantasmagoria, in a sense. Stereo views were super popular in the 19th century. And if anyone, like, 
you're like me, I grew up with a little, uh, my kids have them too, those view masters. You know, this three-dimensional illusion is so impressive. Uh, a former Supreme Court Justice's son, uh, um, I've forgotten his name now, Holmes, I think, yeah, the Holmes Bates Stereo Viewer, one of our Supreme Court Justice, I think, son, invented one of the viewers, which is very popular, and he wrote about it, and he was talking about how incredibly important the stereo view is to the, uh, the future of imaging, basically. So very impressive um, technology for its day. You get a three-dimensional illusion. Here's the albumin stereo view made by Jackson of Thomas Moran for the U.S. Geological Survey. Moran is the artist, Jackson is the photographer, but oddly enough, Hayden frequently, in his book, which is filled with these contradictions in it, Hayden frequently says, the artist's works are the scientifically valuable ones, but that's the artist making those. The photographer's works are more valuable for the publicity side of the survey, trying to promote it. So there's an interesting tension there between art and science and the art and publicity. So Moran, in any case, is posing here. And according to Jackson's biography, which is in your library, uh, time exposure, Moran was underneath the dark cloth with Jackson sometimes, looking at the ground glass image. And if, if, you, if you've never looked through a camera, a four by five camera or an eight by 10 camera at the ground glass, it is absolutely a magical thing to do, and I would encourage you to do that. Here's a comparison between those two views with Moran posing. Here's one that Marclette rephotographed. I'm just noticing the time, and uh, I don't want to keep you longer than an hour. This is Jackson on the left, mammoth hop springs. And notice Marclette's rephotograph. What happens when the fingers of time can be animated? It's pretty interesting. Let me pull this up. <coughs> Thomas Moran again, by the way, right there. He's harder to see, but he's up there up against the rock. Here's this website, three different views. Jackson's is first. Here's a second one. Here's a third one. Mark Klett's writings talk about this is an ongoing monitoring process. Here's the automated or the animated version. So Jackson and O'Sullivan and Russell and all of these US Geological Survey photographers and the geologists who hired them I think, are thinking like Mark Klett. Mark Klett is actually a geologist who became a fine art photographer, in my opinion, he's a fine art photographer. He's also a scientist, though. He's a geologist that uses a camera. And he's the one that thought of doing this rephotographic survey. So all of them, I believe, are interested in the phantasmagoria, trying to create things that are too slow, trying to speed those up, trying to see things that happen too slow, just like my bridge was trying to see things that are too fast. I would love to hear any comments or questions you might have. Uh, thank you very much for coming, and thanks to the uh, Cody Institute for Western American Studies for bringing me here. I very much enjoyed my time.